If you're an entrepreneur, you know what it means to take personal and financial risks, create jobs that support your community, and devote most of your time to your business. But do you know how to plan for a successful exit from your business? Do you know who should be involved in creating your succession or transition plan and the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. The podcast theme is inspired by critically acclaimed business author, Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. In this podcast, you'll hear success stories of exit plans done right and pick up practical tips based on years of legacy business advisors' expertise and knowledge about the largest and most important financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good day, and welcome to the Finish Big Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Dorman. And today, I'm going to be joined by a friend, Jerome Myers. Uh, I happen to have the good fortune of appearing on his broad, uh, podcast recently. But let me tell you a little bit about Jerome and his podcast. Jerome Myers is a, an award-winning engineer turned business strategist. Jerome uses his rich experience and innate understanding of human emotions to ensure that your journey from the corporate world to entrepreneurship is a fulfilling one. At the helm of a division of a multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 company, Jerome created a thriving $20 million operation with 170 dedicated team members. Now he employs that expertise to advise leaders across diverse industries from real estate to healthcare, guiding them to double their revenue, add harmony in their work life integration and ramp up their charitable contributions. Jerome's also the host of the Dream Catchers podcast. You can check that out and we'll talk about that here shortly. Jerome Myers, welcome to Finish Big. Mark, so good to be with you, man. Thanks for making a few minutes for me to come hang out with you and your audience. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's get right to it. So uh, your journey, as I've you know kind of done a little research here, is a bit different than most of our guests. Let's uh, take me back to the beginning. Let's start with your podcast today and maybe work backwards a little bit, but let's start with your podcast. Tell us about Dreamcatchers. How, what was the genesis of that idea uh, what's the mission behind your show, et cetera? Yeah, we're close to 300 episodes in now. So it's had a couple wow. of pivots along the way. The initial inception concept was we were doing Clubhouse before Clubhouse was cool, even though I don't know if Clubhouse is still cool today, but it was all the rage a few a little while back. And so every Tuesday or two Tuesdays a month, it was on the second and fourth Tuesday, we'd have a conference call. And I'd invite a guest on and they'd share their experiences with the hope of creating a space for people to get some education, direction, and inspiration on their journey. And we were like, man, this is helping people, but maybe if people could consume it at their leisure, that it would help more people. And so instead of doing what were then called tribe calls, we moved it over and started calling it dream catchers. And actually one of my best friends, a guy named Deron Chandler was the first guest. He's episode zero or episode one. And in that episode, we just took the recording from a tribe call and brought Deron in to talk about his journey on how he think he paid off a really large amount of debt, or maybe he just got another promotion and finally broke six figures. I can't remember exactly what the, topic mm -hmm. that we covered on that was fast forward um, I guess it's like almost five years now we now talk to founders who have exited and we want to understand that process better than anybody else in the country and the goal with it is to help folks get comfortable with having the conversation specifically about the founders exit paradox and that is what people go through when they get on the other side of the exit and you start asking three big questions. What was it all for? Is this really it? And what now? Mm. And they're asking these questions because much of their identity, many of their relationships, the work that they used to do is gone. And now they're trying to figure out what post-exit life looks like. And yeah. so these newly exited operators, we call them NEOs. We, we want to bring them in so that people who are, thinking about exiting, have some understanding of what is potentially 
more than likely going to happen to them on the backside of yeah, this their is going to be a, this is going to be a great episode. So let me just uh, add a little bit of color there and, and, and the very, the timeliness of this particular episode, Jerome, and thank you again for joining us. I have a good friend of mine who's written a book called trapped in the family business. His name is Dr. Michael Klein. And he and I were chatting about three weeks ago because I had a client who got a very substantial sum of money wired into his account. And it's interesting, everything you just said in your, your introductory comments there had nothing to do with money or deal structure. It was all identity and emotion, right? Um, and I said, you know, Dr. Klein, it's almost the equivalent, I'm not a woman, obviously, of postpartum depression. And he goes, wow, that's very insightful. It's almost like, you know, my client said to me, I should be very happy. I've got multiple seven figures in my, our, our checking account, my wife and I, and I feel like I just lost my best friend. And mm -hmm. this individual happened to be a gentleman went through a very, very long, uh, journey of trying to fight back to the new identity, the new, the new self. So what have you learned in 300 episodes? What are some of the themes that you've come up, you know, that you see repeating in some of the emotions that men and women have faced? Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting. And that gentleman, he doesn't have a diagnosis, right? And I think that's really important for people to understand. Uh, and so like going, I don't think going the traditional mental health route is the answer, because there is no diagnosis. I mean, they might give you a pill, but that's not actually going to solve the problem for you. It's just going to numb it. And so what we see mm -hmm. more than anything else is that there are six centers of doubt. Self-image, relationship, and work are the first three levels. And this is the day-to-day. -day. These are the things that you spend the most time in. You Repeat think that self-image, self relationship, relationship, and work. Relationships and work. If you think about your day to day experiences, this is what that is what it all, is all constituted. It's all right. How am I interacting, thinking about engaging with myself? How am I in Who am I interacting, engaging with? And then what am I doing with my time? You, the folks who don't figure what this stuff looks like on the backside. Before they get to it, end up in getting hit really hard. So you'll see founders, there's two types of founders. There's a founder who's always got something else going on on the side, right? Then there's a founder who does things sequentially. They just do one thing at a time. The other one we call parallel. So the person who's parallel, they've already always got something else going on. So they don't actually ever like experience the full brunt of this exit paradox. For yeah. the founder who does things sequentially, it's like, oh, I, I, I lost the thing that I had. I, and the best way that I can describe it is relationships. If somebody's dating multiple people, they don't actually feel the full brunt when somebody ends one of those relationships sure. because they've got all these other things to distract them or these other people to distract them. Where it's like, oh, I've been faithful to my wife for 40 years and she passed away or something. They're crushed. They don't know what they're going to do. They couldn't imagine life without this in it. Right. So again, self-image relationships and work. So they're typically asking questions like this self-image. Who am I now that I've won the game? Right. You get the Super Bowl ring. Now what? You get the six figures, seven, eight figures wired into your account because you sold your business. What do I do now? they had a hyper-focused routine because you don't exit by chance. Like you built mm -hmm. something meaningful. You usually have some rigor, some consistency, some discipline. And now you take the need for that out. Well, who am I now? And what do I do? Right, and then right. there's this other one that is rooted in guilt. And it's, it's riddled with what some people would call imposter syndrome. And they, they ask the question, do I even deserve it? They scrape, they scratch. Uh, I think that I can, I can relate to that. It's like, wow. I mean, I, my business can't be worth that much. I mean, it's just kind of, it's just kind of what I did, what I do. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, obviously uh, the namesake of this uh, podcast or the origin finish big from Bo Burlingham's book. Chapter two is entitled, if I'm not my business, then who am I? 
And who am I? Right. And it profiles a gentleman in Chicago. It's right in the book. His name is Bruce. And uh, he says that he sold this. He had a multiple, you know, multiple million dollar exit, sold his business. And next thing you know, his phone stopped ringing. Nobody needed him. Nobody asked him. Uh, he'd walk into the Chicago Athletic Club and he wasn't Bruce who owned this business. He was the guy that used to, but now he's retired. And it just is, and it just, it's very, very interesting. I would very obviously recommend finish big time and time again on this podcast, but the exit paradox, very interesting, but you actually have an engineering background. I do. So how in the world, and you yeah. ran a you know significant business and you left corporate America. Well, take us back. I mean, how did you get into this space? You're quite good at it. And by the way, huge plug for dream catchers. I think your intro is phenomenal. Uh, when I listen to it, it's so creative. Every time I listen to it, I'm like, man, that is really, really good. But well, take Thank us you. back to the the origin of your career and how you ended up at this destination, if you will. Yeah, it's been a, a, a wild ride of a bunch of twists and turns that it seemed like a bunch of scattered experiences, but I think it ended up being something that uniquely prepared me for. Yeah, what I can is. so relate to that. And so, you know, I, I went to engineering school. I played football for four years while I Where was at? there at North Carolina A&T State University. Uh -huh. And I I had all of that. We were traveling. I'm working a job. I've got academic scholarships. And I'm doing the thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be successful. And then I get about halfway through it. And I'm like, I don't want to be an engineer. And I started looking around I was like, well, what do I want to do? And me and my buddy were sitting on the stoop of our apartment building and I was paying $3.95. I had two roommates doing the same thing. And downstairs he was doing the same thing. And I was like, man, this guy's making $700,000 a year, but we never saw him or talked to him. Like that is amazing. He's decoupled his time for his money. So how can I do that? And I never figured it out while I was in school. So I did what you're supposed to do. I got good grades. That's because they don't teach us that in school, right? Yeah, they right. do not. And yeah. I didn't know them. See, I'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. So people with multi-million dollar real estate portfolios weren't coming up to the cookout. And yeah. so I, I did what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I got into the, uh, I got the job uh, out of school and I uh, started, I was working for the power company as an engineer. I was designing foundations and uh, poles and towers. And I was putting antenna, cell phone antennas on some of our uh, facilities. And I was like, Ooh, what do I want to do? What do I want to be when I grow up here? And so I was like, Ooh, I want to lead a division. And so I started pursuing mentorship and there's a guy named Craig and I see Craig in the hallway. And I said, Hey, Craig, you're, uh, there's 17,000 employees here. There's 88 executives and you're the only black guy. And I was like, uh, you make me believe that it's possible for me to run a business here. And he said, well, just do a great job and your color doesn't matter. I said, I, I hear you, but there's only one of you out of 88. So, I mean, there's gotta be something special about it. And so he was like, yeah, Jerome, don't worry about it. And so I, I got really immersed in um, helping the company that I was working for recruit from more diverse universities and trying to change the talent pool because I, I knew of a bunch of people who would actually be pretty successful there. And so I made, kind of made a name for myself, got identified as a high potential person, got into a bunch of different programs, started getting promotions, getting moved around to different jobs. And then I ended up in a job I hated, Mark. And I, I hated the job so much over the course of the three years and five months and 22 days and about 80, uh, it was probably, it was a little less than 80 hours. I, I applied for a hundred jobs and the hundred jobs I applied for, I got 10 interviews and I got one job offer to go back and be an entry-level engineer. And I didn't, I wasn't going to do that. I was going to take a pay cut. I was making six figures at that point. And so I was like, what do I do? And so finally, somebody came to save me, moved me to a new job. And they said, hey, Jerome, if you don't get a promotion in six months, we're going to cut your pay. And so I leave the power company and then I move into consulting. And then I move from a small consulting firm to a large consulting firm. I've got global responsibilities for engineering. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I get to go to Africa and I get to fly across the country. And it's like, man, this isn't really that cool. I want to be at home. Yeah. So then <laughs> I get recruited out of there. That sounds really cool. It sounds really cool until you're actually in in the uh, hotel and you got to call your kid instead of look at your kid. And then um, 
I, I there was like, but because I had that title, right? This is a phone call stuff, right? I had the title, people were calling me, and he was like, Hey, Jerome, there's a really cool project. I was like, Okay, what do you got? And it's like, you know, this has never been done before. Okay, that's interesting. What are you talking about? You're, you're going to take overhead power lines and put them underground. I was like, Okay, that sounds interesting. He's like, Yeah, we want to partner with your company to do that. I was like, uh, Okay. And then they're like, No, we changed our mind. We want you to come work for us. And so on January 13th of 2015, I uh, move over to a, a power, not a, I guess it's a, a utility contractor and I'm employee number two in the division. And I look up at the end of September, Mark, and we've got 175 folks on my team. By the end of the year, we did $20 million in revenue, 30% profit margins. And I get a phone call on December 24th at 4.55 and it says, hey, Jerome, I made a decision. Look, we're going to lay half the team off. I was like, nah, that's not the right answer. He's like, yeah, you and I have been going back and forth about this for about a month, but that's the answer. I made a decision. I said, yeah, I get it, but that's not what we're going to do. He's like, I didn't call to negotiate with you. I made a decision. I said, yeah. I understand that, but it's not the right answer. I'm stubborn, Mark. He's like, you don't get it. So this is what we're going to do. You can be a part of it or not, but I am going to go spend the rest of your year with my family. And so then he ended the call. I was like, oh man, I guess this is a bit serious. I better figure out what we're going to do. So yeah. we we go through that and we lay off half the group because that's what I was told I was going to do. And I thought I had control, but I didn't. Fast forward to next year, same thing's about to happen. I drop out of corporate. Um, so from there, I say, well, what am I going to do? Because What I, year was this, Jerome? That's 2016. And so then what am I going to do? I said, oh, yeah, you remember that thing in college you wanted to do? You should probably figure out how to do that now. And so I, I go into real estate. Eventually, we build a multi-million dollar real estate portfolio of apartment buildings. And I got really lonely. I was like, man, I miss what people used to do when they come into the office and I get to develop them and grow them and help yeah, them the interaction accomplish and the coaching stuff. And yeah. Mm -hmm. No, only people that wanted to talk to me as a real estate owner were people who were my partners who wanted to know if I was sending them a check and people who wanted to buy the stuff that I had. And I didn't like calling them back because they always wanted to lowball me. So I was like, I've got this one coaching client that I've been working with. Maybe I should double down on that. And so we start doing that and we start getting results. And those results look like people doubling their income and doubling their time off and doubling their charitable giving. It's like, man, so if we can do this, then the businesses are more valuable. What happens when people start selling them and exiting them? And then I saw it happen a couple of times on a smaller scale. And then I saw it on the big scale. There was a guy talking about selling Kajabi. It was a $2 billion exit. And he was giving a lecture on how Kajabi is a your... big kind of uh, portal where it stores video and teaching. I've used that for some training yeah. in the past, right? Yeah. And so he he's going through how they built it. And he's like, yeah, it took my wife telling me that I was having an existential crisis to realize that I was in trouble. And I said, so... And he got through the end to it. And I say, hey, um, are you ready for this? And he's like, uh, with a setup like that, I don't know. I said, uh, well, it's going to force you to think. And he said, uh, yeah, go ahead. And I said, so how'd you get out of your crisis? And he said, I'll let you know when I do. Oh, my. And so it was then that I realized. So you get to the in the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And then you find out that financial freedom isn't the right F. Fulfillment is. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment is the thing that everybody is seeking. Once you figured mm -hmm. out the money problem, you want to figure out the impact problem. Most people mm -hmm. are doing things because they pay them well, not because they make the maximum impact. But once you have freedom of time, the best thing that you can do after you've taken care of yourself and your family and so on is figure out how to make the most impact that you can on the world. And so yeah. that's what we've just doubled down on. We want to normalize this conversation that you're not the only one that feels the way you feel. You're not ungrateful because you feel the way you feel it's normal. Right. And we have tools, we have techniques, we have tips to help people move through that. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, it's, it's you know, use that word normal. I mean, that's such a, 
such a powerful world. When I word uh, when I speak with our clients, we do a lot of exit planning here in Northeast Ohio. For we're very very fortunate, some great businesses. But uh, at the very onset of our engagements and throughout the engagement, I'm constantly saying to them, "This is normal." It's okay for you to feel this way. It's okay that you don't understand what your options are. You're not alone. And you can just see the sense of relief in business owners' faces when they understand that you understand their, their journey, their feelings, that 99 times out of 100, it's not about getting every less red cent. It's, to your point, it's about exiting and being fulfilled at, you know, at the same time. And it's, and then working with people to help them not only prepare for the financial exit in terms of get their business ready and using value optimization strategies, et cetera, but, you know, really letting them know that this is going to be, there's going to be a, a significant change here, almost like the death of a family member. Right. And, you know, it's okay for you to, I've heard it a million times. Ah, that's not going to bother me. No problem. Right. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a tough person or I've, and then it happens and you, and you can see like, wow, I'm really feeling this way. Can we talk about it again? And that's, and that's what I love about the exit planning space. Succession planning is the, the rapid acceleration of the intimacy and relationships, right? You just get to work with business owners, men and women, and the things they share and what they'll admit to, like, hey, I'm really good at this in my business, but here's all the stuff I don't know. And I can't really share this with my team because they'll view that maybe as a weakness. At least that's the owner's perspective. So it, it's been phenomenal. But who would you say on your Dream Catchers podcast was your most memorable episode or memorable guest? If, you, if I, if it, When I think about when I think about our model, the person that came on that just checked every single box was a guy named Rick Martinez. And wow. so that, that and, didn't take you long to figure that out. Huh? That, yeah. I mean, he just walked down the path. And so it's like, oh, I'm doing this for myself. And so like there's eight exits of a founder from our perspective. It starts with leaving being an employee. And so your chief everything officer, that's the first role you walk into. People think CEO is really glamorous when they first get started, but they, most people realize they trade it in a nine to five, four, five to nine, right? Yeah, and so yeah. they're doing all the stuff. They're trying to figure it all out. And so that's what Rick did. He was a nurse. He left. He decided to be on contract for himself. Then he got other people involved and it wasn't just him doing the stuff. And that was exit number two, getting out of frontline work and managing the people instead of being the person doing the work. And then you get another person put in to actually start running the day-to-day -day operations so you can get out of the minutia. And so he kept going up and then he talked about getting to the place. The only st box that he didn't check was putting a board in place, but he talked about, how he got the pot of gold, right? This is exit six for us. He got the pot of gold and he thought about all the people that said he couldn't. He thought about all the people who told him he was crazy, all the people who told him he was going to be wrong. He's like, guess who was wrong now, right? And there was nobody there. It was just him and the check. And that was the validation for him that he had done the thing. And then he went into the slump, right? He full, full on founder's exit paradox. And he started a CrossFit gym and he started investing money in these things because most people build a portfolio of businesses after the exit. And he was trying to find the place. That is a, that is a very good, uh, I mean, I, I, I see that as well, right? The, mm -hmm. the serial entrepreneur, they, you know, once you give them a lot of liquidity and capital, then it's just like, right, now we're going to deploy it. Uh, they don't understand most of them. Right. Yep. And yep. they're just yep. hoping that one of them hits and that's OK. But, you know, they build a portfolio. And so Rick's doing a thing. He's running CrossFit gyms. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's ghost writing for people. And eventually he finds a thing that actually provides fulfillment for him, which was something that he liked when he was young. It was writing. And so now he got rid of all that other stuff. And it took him being injured for him to slow down long enough to realize that none of that stuff was bringing him any joy. And that the only thing he really enjoyed was writing. 
Mm. And so now he's using that to help people tell their stories and that's giving him an opportunity to create significance, right? So the story, one, he helps that person get it out. And then two, everybody who reads the book is impacted by this work that Rick did. And so at the end of the day, everybody comes back to the place of trying to figure out how they're going to make a big impact. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that is intuitive for people who haven't studied the process, but Rick and just about everybody else has checked the box. It was a lady named Joey that came on and she had the very similar, her stuff wasn't as impactful because it didn't take her years and years to build her business. Whereas Rick built his thing over 15 years. And so when I see people who've had their business for over 15 years, the intensity with which they feel the founders exit paradox is exponentially greater than some of the people who are just flipping businesses. And I think that's probably a important distinction. Yeah, that's great. This has been great. Uh, Jerome Myers is our guest today, host of the Dream Catchers podcast and multiple serial entrepreneur at this point in time. How do people get a hold of you, Jerome? And tell us where we can find Dream Catchers podcast and how do we learn more about the exit paradox? Yeah. So Dreamcatchers podcast is on every platform as well as YouTube. Um, you can get it on Spotify, Apple, wherever you usually listen. If you're listening to this, just type in Dreamcatchers and you'll, you'll find us there. The Exit Paradox. So if you're curious about learning about the five mistakes that most founders make, uh, we've got a free white paper on that. You hop over to theexitparadox.com. There you get that free white paper. Once you get that white paper, Later on, we'll send you our full ebook uh, called Beyond the Exit. And it breaks down in detail the founder's exit paradox. It gives you coping strategies for dealing with it. And it also gives you a path for you to make that transition from being in the hole or in, in the valley back to the mountaintop. So you can actually climb that second mountain. That's great. Great. Jerome, I have to ask you, I think you said you went to North Carolina AT&T, correct? I went to North Carolina A&T, that's sir. A&T, okay, A&T, and that's an HBCU school, right? That is. Coach Prime, what are your thoughts? I, I'm really excited for him. I, I'm um, a big fan, by the way. I'm a yeah. big fan. It's good, it's good yeah. for me. I've always been a Buffalo, a Colorado Buffalo fan, but they've been so awful for 20 years. They, but what, are, what are your thoughts? I think, I think what he's doing is so powerful. Yeah, I think what he did at Jackson State was transformational. And I think yeah. it's for other, you, there are people who get things started. They're the catalyst, much like startup founders. Mm -hmm. And then they go on and do bigger things. I don't think any, I don't think it would have been wise for him to not move and get his, we got to be clear. He's got two sons who have NFL aspirations. Mm -hmm. he's got to get them in the best position to get them to where they want to go. Yep. Shador wants to be, you know, a first round quarterback draft pick that is going to change his future financially for sure. And so for him to stay at Jackson state and hope that that happened for his son is not realistic. Now, once, and he's coached his kids all the way through, like I, I realized that he was helping coach in high school as well. So with that being said, I think it's extremely important to understand that any father is going to take care of their home before they go take care of the world. Now on the backside, does he stay at Colorado? I don't know. I think being two and two right now works out well. Can he build a program? He's a catalyst, right? He's paved the way for other athletes. And uh, obviously he was a quite a controversial figure uh, as far as the, uh, I mean, my goodness, the baseball career and the football career and all the, the, his big, huge persona, but you know, you kind of peel away the onion and here's this tremendous leader, uh, an inspirational character. So uh, Jerome, I, I really appreciate your time here today. Um, I'm going to have you back on the show. We'll explore some more of these uh, exit owners paradox, but uh, I hope our listeners enjoyed listening to Jerome Myers today, the, uh, the host of the dream catchers podcast. And until we, Visit again to our listeners. Here's to finishing big. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes are available. Learn more at LegacyBusinessAdvisors.com 
or call 330-350-5410. Please be aware the information in these podcasts represent the views and opinions of our guests and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of legacy business advisors. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professional with any questions regarding your specific situation.